Go ahead. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, wow, I can't believe I'm getting to speak to so many of you at once. This is really exciting. Um, if you didn't know, my name is Caitlin Bowden. Um, I am the CEO and founder of Badass, which stands for Battling Against Demeaning and Abusive Selfie Sharing. Um, I'm going to be doing a brief intro real quick of who we are and what we do. And, um, then I'm going to introduce you to my amazing team. Um, so here we go. Um, well, Badass started out originally because I found out that I myself was a victim. And, um, you know, I saw the scope of the issue, how big it is. Um, I was a victim of non-consensual pornography or um, non-consensual Im intimate images being shared online uh, when I didn't want them to be. I started researching the websites that were surrounding this kind of stuff and saw how big the problem was and how there were no resources for this sort of stuff. Um, I got really sick of feeling helpless, so I started reaching out to other victims. Um, I kind of wanted to crowdsource justice. and you know, I found all these amazing, wonderful human beings who were just as, just as sick of being as helpless as I was. Um, and we just got together and sort of brainstorming different ways we could fight back. Um, now, before all this happened, I was a bartender and didn't have any experience in any sort of, you know, tech field or really much of anything other than making the best Long Island you'll ever have in your entire life. Um, you know, but I went from being a bartender to, you know, helping introduce legislation in the state of Ohio that would criminalize revenge porn, which we did get passed, um, you know, to organizing, you know, a huge group and helping out thousands of victims, um, helping them remove their photos and collect evidence and um, see some justice. Uh, you know, and then I got to go and introduce a federal bill, um, you know, which is still you know, going through the process, but hopefully uh, pretty soon it might be a criminal act in the United States, which is what we'd like to see. Um, you know, and now I get to talk to you guys. So really this is like the peak of my career thus far. Uh, you know, but why am I speaking to you? This is DEF CON. You don't want to hear about, um, you know, legislation right now. We are supposed to he be here talking about hacking and tech. Um, and, you know, uh, and I'm here kind of because y'all keep insisting on it. <laughs> Everyone keeps insisting I'm a hacker. I cannot write a line of code, but, uh, you know, I have helped organize a thousand victims to fight back and we've gotten to do a lot of really cool stuff. Um, you know, from, you know, posting thousands of pictures of Shrek to drown out threads of nudes being shared without consent. Um, and, you know, teaching them some tips and tricks on how to be secure and, you know, still express their sexuality online. Um, you know, and there's other things that we've done that are best left for Sky Talks. Uh, my lawyer is here. She will yell at me, so got to be quiet on that one. Um, and here we are. Uh, I would love to introduce you to this amazing and wonderful team. I'm actually just going to be moderating this panel. I'm going to be letting them speak because um, I get a lot of chances too, and it's time for their voices to get heard. So without further ado, let me introduce you to my badasses. All right, first off, we have Kate Venable, uh, the aforementioned lawyer. Um, she is our head of legal. Uh, she keeps us out of trouble and uh, you know helps victims with their own specific cases. Um, next, we have Rachel Lamp, who's my COO. She is amazing and wonderful and um, has more empathy, I think, than any other human being I've ever met in my entire life. Coming next, we have Marley Farlow, who's our CMO. Uh, she is creative, she is fun, she is organized, um, which is the opposite of me, I'm very disorganized. We, next, we have Allie Barnes, uh, who is our CTO, um, who explains all the things that you, know, you guys talk about when I have dumb questions and teaches me a little bit about tech and then Finally, we have Timmy Doomsday, who is our CISO, CISO, however that's said. Um, and he is a blast. He's hilarious to be around. And he is really focused on making sure that we have all of our security locked down tight. Um, and I'm going to be uh, asking them some questions. And you can ask them some questions. And let's uh, 
get this thing started. Hey. <laughs> Hi. Hey. What's happening? Hello. Hi. So I just hey. did a really brief recap of what we've you know done thus far and what we've accomplished with badass but i would love to hear um let's start this out you know on the positive i want to hear y'all brag and talk about your favorite thing that has happened thus far with badass what is your favorite accomplishment let's start with rachel i would say my favorite accomplishment with badass is definitely getting that um law passed in ohio it absolutely it was life-changing it was so great to be able to take something that would assist so many victims because a lot of us like in the beginning we we were based in Ohio um so being able to to have a course of action for our immediate base was just really life changing yeah kate i know you've gotten a lot yeah um the law was awesome um never really expected that to happen um on in the same vein of things I never expected to happen was, you know, my best friend is like, let's start a nonprofit. And here we are. Um, I really like when I went to law school, never thought ever that this is anything remotely close to what I would be doing. And it's so cool and it's so awesome. And it's so much more interesting than half of what all my friends do. So I really enjoy it. All right, Marley. Um, so as a team, I'd say like every time we help a victim is just like a huge accomplishment when I see one of our victims come into our group and let us know that they actually receive justice. Um, definitely something to rejoice about. And then on a personal level, um, my favorite professor from my university asked me to come and teach a course with her um, to like hundreds of students about this issue. Um, I did it once and she's asked me to come back indefinitely and definitely. I'm just super pumped about that. All right, Allie. Um, so favorite accomplishment that I've gotten to like be around and witness is definitely um, Tits for DEF CON was great to witness. And on a personal level, um, you know, just getting to, I think one of my favorite things has been like the cybersecurity awareness month that we did um, and stuff like that has been my favorite. All right, and finally, Timmy, the newest member of this team. Right, so I'm like the squid, right? So, um, you know, my biggest accomplishment, honestly, is to just be here with these wonderful people on this panel today. Uh, um, you know, I started out, Rachel recruited me as a, as just a, you know, humdrum volunteer working, working uh, victim intake, you know, and now I get to, I get to sit here with these wonderful people and talk to all of you. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, so now that we've gone over the past a little bit, let's talk about the present. Um, I know lately we've been a little bit absent um, on our social media pages. We've been taking just a teensy bit of a hiatus, although we are still reachable um, in case of emergency if victims need to reach out. But uh, so where have we been? Well, I think we all took a break to reflect on pretty much what we wanted badass to be in the future going forward. And also we were just really out of spoons <laughs> um, as most of us are victims of some sort of sexual abuse or image abuse. It really, it takes a toll to continuously have to, you know, go through and reopen those wounds and, and assist victims. Mm -hmm. We also, think... oh, go on. Sorry. Um, I was just going to say, and I think like, we're not, I mean, uh, while we do a lot of remote stuff, we're not immune from, you know, the effects of quarantine um, that everybody else is feeling like we're all still here trying to figure out what in the world it means to work from home and how we have to change our model. Like nobody knows what like the next day brings in terms of COVID and all of that. So I think that went a lot like went into um, our decision to just like take a step back because we're all trying to figure it out along with everybody else. Yeah. Um, I think a big thing also is uh, that we, you know, we started this and it just blew up and we were just learning as fast as we could. Um, 
you know, the best ways to go about doing things and to run an organization at this size. I mean, we went from being a group of 10 of us to a global thing. And, uh, you know, we, we were just scrambling to catch up, but nothing, we didn't have any, any, you know, procedures and things in place that were long-term sustainable. We were just doing whatever we needed to do in that moment. And we needed to organize. We needed to figure out the best ways to do things. So. Yeah. And I think like, because of, uh, because of a lot of us being victims, like we just coming into this organization came into it, like crazy passionate and wanting to take on like anything and everything. So a lot of us were like, like I'm in marketing, but then I'm going out and trying to do law enforcement training and I'm doing classes at colleges and like taking on so much because I want to, and I'm excited to help and move this forward. And then of course, you know, burnout comes into play and um, we have to look at ourselves as an organization and look at what we want to do, what we want to focus on and do well, and then expand from there. So. Exactly. And you mentioned um, law enforcement training. So let's talk a little bit about the laws and responses from law enforcement. Um, just quick thumbs up or thumbs down from the team here. Um, do you think that law enforcement is doing an excellent job of handling um, reports and complaints about when it comes to non-consensual image abuse? What do we think? All right. So let's talk about that. <laughs> I'm what gonna say do, what do you think can be done to change that? <laughs> uh, training <laughs> for one. Yeah, um, yeah, well, like for me uh, as a victim, going through my own personal case, it took nine times to report my own victimization. And um, a lot of the, the the reason was nobody knew that they that they handled cyber crimes and that they didn't have cyber crime units, and they told me to call the FBI and it just like blew my mind. I'm looking at a statute saying like, it literally says number four, local law enforcement handles this issue. So like, why is there this disconnect between you understanding that you can do something for victims? And uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna say training is one of the biggest issues here. Okay. Um one of the Something else that I noticed, and maybe Kate, you can speak to this a little bit more, but like when I was first brought on, I, you know, I was working on building resources for victims. And one of that was going through and just making the law a little bit more digestible. And it seems like a lot of the laws that are on the books can't even decide what a nude is. And that seems to be like the basis of the entire conversation. So if we can't even agree on a vocabulary to talk about these things, how are we going to push effective legislation? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would definitely agree with that. Um, like, it's not only just like what is a nude, but um, I know Marianne Franks has talked about this a lot in a lot of the stuff that she does with CCRI. And I mean, we most of the laws have these intent to harm clauses, and basically what it says basically you have to prove that the poster intended to harm the victim in whatever way by posting it and it's next to impossible to prove and it's next to impossible maliciously to yeah yeah uh, that vocabulary malicious Oof. yeah it, it makes it pretty much impossible to enforce at all and i think um yeah i mean it just goes on what you said to me like we have to agree on something and then we write these laws and we think they sound all good and great and but then intent to harm makes it this i wouldn't say useless per se but it makes it hard and it even complicates it further once you get into crossing state lines or country lines because the language of each state law is so entirely different and you know it's hard enough getting police to want to pursue justice for these victims but once it crosses state lines they just give up pretty much all together yeah um the language has definitely been an issue uh speaking of language um most people know about the uh type of abuse that we're fighting against they know it as revenge porn uh what do you guys think about just that wording um I'm going to go. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> um, 
I like I get it. it it's like I, the media kind of jumped on that term and sensationalized it, um, especially with the fappening and and things like that happening. But when you really break it down, revenge porn specifically deals with like intimate partners um, abusing one another. Um, and it really only represents 8% of non-consensual image abuse cases. Um, so I don't like it for that reason, but like more than that, the term revenge automatically implies that the victim did something wrong. So there's like victim blaming built into it. Um, and then the term pornography also has a false sense of consent built into it. Cause generally people who are creating and, and creating Pornography content are consenting to be taped and shared, which none of these victims are. So personally, I don't like the term. I will use it in cases where I'm trying to get some awareness out and people aren't understanding what I'm talking about. So more as a reference point, um, or if I'm specifically t dealing with somebody whose former partner or current partner is uh, abusing them. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I like the way that you just drop that stat out there. Like it's only 8%. Um, are there any more stats that you think are really important to share? Actually, since you are our stats person, you know this stuff better than any of us. Stats on stats. <laughs> stats on um, stats on stats. Yeah, it, it's actually kind of interesting because uh, there's not a ton of resources dedicated to researching this topic. Um, like CCRI is amazing. They so far have put out the most research on the topic. Um, I did recently see one that came out in February that said that the rate in which this is happening is one in three people are being victimized. Um, and that was just two months ago. Um, but that was that was geared more towards European countries and wasn't a worldwide view. Um, the most recent stat we have as far as worldwide is concerned is 2017, which said it was one in eight people. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into lots of reasons why that is uh, rising quickly, but it's, it's hard to say. I'm going to go with probably something closer to one in five, one in six as of currently, but it's something that we really need research on. Um, and then I know another interesting fact is that you know, this affects three out of four women. Uh, victims are are women in most cases or female identifying people. Um, but in cases where the victim does identify as male, it's 90% of those cases inc incorporate sex torsion as well as the image abuse. So that's just some, some facts. And yeah, this, those are scary, scary figures to hear. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that many people this is happening to, this is a huge problem, um, you know, but the biggest thing that we hear when we discuss these sorts of things with the public or in the press, um, immediately the first thing we hear is, well, this wouldn't be a problem if you just didn't take those pictures. And so we hear it so much. I know we all have a ton of different responses that we go to. Uh, so let's let's share all those responses. Let's just get that out of the way. Rachel, I, I can see it. You're about to explode with things to say. <laughs> I have so many words for people who say such things, but um, I'm gonna keep it professional-ish. Um, <laughs> it is it is not the, the victim's fault. Like it's 2020, we have cell phones attached to us. They're basically part of us. It, it only makes sense that, you know, people would be using their cell phones in their sex lives as well. I mean, it, it, we, we use it to <laughs> record when we sleep, like to tell us when we fart, like when we talk in our sleep, like of course it's gonna be um, incorporated into re sexual relationships as well. So I think the thought of excluding that or, or blaming the person because of them using and expressing their sexuality within a consenting form and that being abused, it, it's just, it's senseless. Mm -hmm. One thing that bugs me is that people always say that when the fact is we, uh, you don't even need to take a nude to become a victim anymore. You know, um, I see deep fakes are already being brought up here in the chat. And that is, you know, something we have been monitoring. Um, so 
what what should we do about the deep face? Do we see that becoming more of a problem? Yeah, I mean, I I feel like the media recently has just realized that that's a thing, but it's something I think our organization has been talking about amongst ourselves and within the community of victims and activists for over a year now, I would say. And then all of a sudden, like within the last, like, I think six months or so, the media is like, oh, deep fakes. And I'm just like looking at the headlines like, uh, duh. Uh, <laughs> where have y'all been? <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, it doesn't necessarily mean you took a nude or anything anymore. Like, it means some jerk put your face on some random naked person and is now exploiting you on the internet. <laughs> I believe our first deep fake victim came to us about a year and a half ago. Um, and since then, it's, I, it's, uh, it's, it's going to continue to rise. Like, it, human curiosity and then us just being bored in quarantine people have a lot of free time on their hands um deep fakes are going to continue to be on the ride yeah i'm actually interested to find out what the stats are on that just because um like being quarantined um people are just stuck in their computers and there's all these apps coming out all the time that allow people to create deep fakes I know that there's that one, uh, I think a year ago or a little less than a year ago that came out and was kind of making waves. And um, I, I really wish I like, I, I knew how to, how to stop that or any advice to prevent that from happening, but it's just, it, it's cropping up everywhere and so quickly that I'm just, I'm not, I'm at a loss personally as, for, as to what to do. And I mean, it doesn't help that, uh, you know, the, the, think about the processing power it takes to do some of that stuff. It wasn't just sitting on your desk two or three years ago. Whereas now I have a laptop that could probably generate a deep fake in an hour or two, you know, with the right, with the right settings. Um, and never underestimate, you know, someone that's time rich and money poor, which is a lot of us right now. Yeah. I was going to say, that's exactly it. People have so much more time to write these tools and stuff now. Yeah. Um, but beyond deep fakes, I mean, that's a, it still is a problem that is growing and it's something we're anticipating. Um, but, you know, the majority of the people coming to us, um, you know, their images that have been leaked are something that they took or allowed a trusted partner to take. Um, and that were leaked without their consent. Um, so say someone wants to, you know, still continue doing that, which we encourage, we encourage that sort of thing, but we want them to do it safely. Um, what tips do you have for people to sext and take nudes and not become victims? Um, so there's a few things I feel like that we tell people. And I mean, I feel like this is the perfect time where I love how we do cybersecurity awareness month. Cause I feel like it's a perfect time to like flood everyone with all the tips every day. And Rachel did such a good job last year. Yeah. I almost said yesterday, <laughs> last year, um, putting stuff together, but you know, basic things are like simple things, but, you know, turning off the location on your phone and making sure your address is not attached to your data um, that's coming from your camera roll. Um, pay attention to what apps you're using and what data they're storing of yours. Um, something that a lot of people don't think of that I've seen people get bit on is like Snapchat memories. You take a picture on Snapchat and you think it goes away, but Snapchat saves it and is like, trying to remind you about it later, but all it takes at that point is someone to get your Snapchat password if you don't have everything protected properly. Um, so those things, you know, keep things we say, keep two factor on for all of the things that you can. Um, you know, pay attention to what's in the pictures that you're sending to people that you don't know or trust. Um, make sure there's maybe no random box in the background with your home address on it. Um, yeah, those are the things that come to mind off the top of my head. Speaking of making sure you know what's in your pictures, EXIF data. You want to make sure to wipe that so you're not accidentally sharing uh, location and stuff like that. Uh, what yeah. else? Oh, I was just, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, um, I, I was done. Go. 
No, I was just going to say, like, so in my day job, um, when I'm lawyering and stuff, uh, this has, like, actually really helped my practice and me helping um, victims and, you know, like, just raising awareness in general as to, like, how to protect your own privacy, not just in terms of image abuse, but, like, if there's domestic violence or stalking or some other, you know, like, menacing or whatever crime you can think of that involves somebody being creepy like it's basic privacy info change your passwords turn on two-factor turn off your location don't give your significant other like unfettered access to where you are 24 7 because that's creepy anyway but that's neither here nor there but i mean it's just i mean basically what ali said like it's stuff that people don't think about and with the way that all these companies like Google and um, Apple and whoever like track our data these days it's important to know what data we're sharing and who is seeing it and what control we have over who it goes to and where it goes to and when and I and, think something and also else... to... sorry <laughs> I was going to say, um, to add on to that, uh, you could you can simply um, watermark your photos with the name of the person you're sending them to. Um, and also you can you can create kind of a contract between each other by um, like asking your partner explicitly like not to send these photos or it will cause me harm. Um, those are really important words because we know that that's how um, the laws really frame them as that intent to harm. So if you can just check that box immediately and screenshot it, keep it in a file with their name, then I think that would really do a lot in the way of um, prevention and also assisting in your own legal case if, if it comes to that point. Yeah, um, I always wanna remind people, you know, you wanna think about the future um, and always hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Um, you know, make that screen, that uh, contract screenshot at your lawyer. If they ever need one, we'll thank you for that. Um, so yeah, that's really important. I know that um, we had discussed Snapchat and other various apps um, that are being used to share these images. Uh, and what, um, what, you know, responsibility do they have, do you think, um, to, you know, prevent this sort of thing from happening? And what are you seeing um, platforms and uh, companies doing that. They're just falling short and letting, you know, victims, victimization happen on their platform. I mean, and do you it, want the real answer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, from my perspective, like, Facebook could like respond to subpoenas that are from not law enforcement, maybe possibly at some point in time that might be helpful. Like if somebody sends stuff during mess, like using Facebook Messenger, it's next to impossible to get anything useful for court. Um, and you're, I'm not law enforcement, so they don't care. Um, I mean, other people can speak to what they've experienced, but that's the first thing that comes to mind for me. Well, the other thing that, the first thing that comes to mind for me are hosting companies, um, right? There's usually a blanket AUP policy that says, don't post these kinds of things, um, but image abuse, if there's, especially if there's not minors involved, right? Um, they it may or may not be on their abuse priority list. Um, so I think it's important to hold these hosting companies accountable and keep letting them know when they're willingly hosting, you know, websites and clients that are um, committing image abuse, like Cloudflare. Oh, wait, wait, wait. What did we have planned for Cloudflare when we said that at some point? I just want to throw that out there. Yeah. Just, we're waving. We're saying hi. Um, <laughs> Uh, now we've run know. into these issues with Cloudflare for a very long time. Um, they have repeatedly, you know, and it's not just them, it, it, but they are the most egregious when it comes to this. Um, what, you know, other apps, let's call them out. Like who is just doing a really shitty job? 
of letting victim of letting victimization happen on their platform and versus who do you think's doing all right like who's actually trying i think that um twitter is quite a shame they could really respond respond to reports i remember that there was act, an actual twitter um account that was for one of these hosting sites and um it took two years for it to be removed and they openly boasted about having specifically leaked images and revenge porn. Um, so Twitter. <laughs> Anyone else? Twitter. Um, I can speak to a couple of ones that have at least been trying. And mind you, their methods aren't perfect. And obviously victimization still happens quite a, lot, a bit on their platform. But at least they are a, either trying to address the problem or prevent it. Um, you know, Facebook, they came out with a... Um, a pilot to try to prevent um, images from being uploaded in the first place. And yes, it's Facebook and nobody's going to trust them. Um, as I believe the press, you know, kind of twisted it to, you know, send Facebook your nudes, which is the worst idea ever. Um, but they were trying. They addressed that there was an issue and, you know, they acknowledged it and they are trying something. Um, and the other one that has been actually good to work with, and I know this is, you know, a bit of a controversial opinion, but Pornhub has um, had their moderators involved with us from the very beginning um, and given us a direct line to making sure that um, things get taken down really quickly as soon as you know anyone discovers there's a problem. And no one has even you know really tried to make sure the problem never happens in the first place yet. Um, but I'm waiting to see that happen next and I'm really excited about that. Anyone else want to call someone out? Want to call out a platform? Start a fight. Let's do it. I mean, we've had issues with Instagram forever. Oh, yeah. Like, reporting. I mean, I personally have know someone who it's not necessarily like revenge porn or image abuse per se, but it started like his victimization started with Instagram and it's been years. And it's taken thousands of people reporting and millions of dollars extorted for them to even do anything. Um, they finally, like, CNN got the story recently. But other than that, like, I mean, it's insane. Like, everybody I know who has been victimized, by, victimized on Instagram has had the worst time even getting them to listen yeah, and that's a shame because I feel like a lot of um, like high school leaks end up on Instagram and the fact that they're not very responsive in a very fast way. Um, really, it's a shame because that stuff should be snuffed out relatively quickly, you know. Um, I have one. <laughs> um, Reddit. <laughs> um, so like they, they try sometimes. Um, my my qualm with them is that they don't uh they have moderators who who do remove content which is great but they don't retain that content so that victims can claim it and use it as evidence um which is kind of a huge problem like in in where i'm in florida and it's a stackable offense here um in my case my image was posted on reddit and also on another site um and the person who did it was only facing a misdemeanor because Reddit took down the image and I had no proof that it was ever there. So, um, you know, I reached out to them directly and asked them like, what's going on? Can you put something in place? If you can flag images as uh, non-consensual image abuse, then you should also be able to like keep them in a repository that's safe, saved for law enforcement to contact and get later. But alas, there's nothing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And how could we forget Discord? Discord. <laughs> oh. uh, that's actually the first time I ever came to Discord was because of my images being in a um, entire revenge porn Discord server, uh, which is lovely. And they also remove content without preserving any of the data. Um, you just have to really hope that the officer you're working with is able to send the preservation of data quick enough before that content is just gone forever. 
and Smash that's cut to the stream getting dropped immediately by Discord. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that's not even in just, you know, image abuse cases with adults. We've run into that issue as well. A lot of our work, um, you know, does involve um, CSAM, um, which is exploitation of children. And so uh, it's been really frustrating to see companies drop the ball on that a lot. <laughs> um, so we've, we've discussed, uh, you know, the platforms and their responsibility. And I know a little bit ago, I just saw a really great talk, actually, um, you know, just a couple hours ago, it was in Crypto Village and it was regarding Section 230, um, as well as the upcoming, you know, the Earn It Act, which is gaining momentum, um, you know, through the process. And, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on those? Yeah, I mean, um, with CDA 230, it has a lot of nuance um, to it. It has some good points, and it also has, it also creates loopholes that I don't know, I don't want to, like, criticize it too much, because I'm not sure that the loopholes were necessarily intentional, but, I mean, when we were talking about Cloudflare earlier, I mean, there's web hosts aren't responsible for the content that they're hosting because of laws like CDA 230. And while they are meant to be helpful, like they also create more problems and I, it just, it needs to be retooled so that it's a better law and has less room for wiggle, like less wiggle room. Um, you know, the biggest argument that I really heard when it comes to that um, you know, and a lot of what our work is, whenever we're trying to talk about legislation regarding this form of abuse, the biggest argument I hear about is about how, um, you know, NCP is, it's a free speech thing. Um, and people claim that, you know, um, this is free speech. And what are your thoughts on that? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I'm, that um, nudity and nude photographs could be free speech, but once it enters into the realm of harming people, that's when it, it exits, you know, um, free speech up until a point. But what, at what point do we consider things to be harmful? Is it, I think it, it comes down to the consent, personally. Yeah, I'd agree with that. That's and it. I think that's where the... I think that's part of the argument um, behind the intent to harm thing, um, intent to harm clause is is that's what makes it not free speech anymore. But we can't define it that broadly and make it that vague because it becomes unenforceable. Um, free speech is complicated. It's way more complicated than the average person would think it is. Mm -hmm. And yes we have free speech but it doesn't mean that you can say what you want and do what you want without repercussions and it doesn't mean that it also doesn't mean that just because it's free speech it's the right or moral thing to do like there's a difference between what our country allows us to say and what is morally and ethically correct um yeah legality doesn't always equal morality nor vice versa Yep. Um, so yeah, um, I know this. I've seen quite a few questions in the chat. Uh, also, big props to my amazing husband, TC. If you haven't noticed, he has been um, helping us field these questions. He's been making sure that we get them um, and any messages uh, that I might be missing because I'm also moderating a panel and don't always have time to look at this chat. He's making sure we see them. Um, and just basically being the most amazing personal assistant in the world. So thank you, TC. Um, so I would like to start addressing some audience questions. Um, all right. And the first one is, uh, given the type of victims that you help, do you find that you as an organization are now targeted in order to gain access to lists of clients by harassers and such like? And they tar they aimed that toward Ali. Um, so, I, I mean, I'll, let's start that off with you. Yeah, um, so I, I would say it definitely, um, you know, makes us more at risk. I don't, 
know if I would say that it's for people wanting to get a list of our victims or clients, um, people that we help so much as it's people that are pissed off um, that we're doing what we're doing and they kind of, you know, feel this need to like plot a revenge against us um, kind of thing. We're taking away their control, right? So they're revenging revenge porn. Yes. Revenge. Right. Yeah, we have a, I mean, I think Caitlin can tell you this. We have a whole lot of trolls. <laughs> um, and yeah. I, can we talk real them. quick, though? Like, speaking of trolls, can we just talk real quick about Tits for DEF CON from last year and uh, how that went? If anyone remembers that. And just, I remember. Just, yeah, that was fun. People were fun. big mad. They were so mad. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, we've gotten like, I mean, yeah, we have we've so gotten, many trolls. We've gotten it's you not just trolls. You can only use you can only <laughs> use money you made in Infosec to come to DefCon. That's the only money you're allowed to use. Yeah, whore money should be spent on poor things. Exactly. <laughs> just what we did, <laughs> right? And we, yeah, our whore went to DefCon, <laughs> right? <laughs> If you're gonna spend uh, more dollars, dinner. you gotta go to Black Hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh my cool. god. I like that. But yeah. Um, and we've had like members of the org be, you know, threatened, re-victimized, doxxed, like all kinds of things. So I'd say, yeah, hundred percent people do target us or they try to. Um, and you know, we all support one another and do our best to fight against that too. I just wanted to show off uh, the whore dollars, the stickers that we had for DEF CON <laughs> last year that say, uh, that says, I spent my whore money at DEF CON and just got a titty out, her favorite one, just one. I think I have three <laughs> whore dollars to my you name. You have three whore dollars? What are you going to buy? What whore things are you going to buy? I found something one special. In my kitchen. I don't know where it came from. I don't know. Um, all right, so the next question. All right, so we discussed, um, you know, do we see ourselves more of a target? I think so. We have had um, people try to infiltrate our, you know, private spaces that we have for victims. Um, we have a lot of different things that we do to make sure that when people contact us, they are who they say they are, um, you know, because there have been some, you know, threats made of people trying to gain access to victims or, you know, looking to, you know, there's a whole separate, there's a whole separate um, fetish for people that enjoy seeing victims' reactions when they find out their photos are out there. They like to get the screenshots of them notifying victims, hey, your pictures are out there, and they freak out. Um, you know, and I had somebody try to do that to me, actually, on Twitter rather recently. Um, and I just made fun of them. It was great, because I no longer give a shit. Um, but that is a thing. So gaining access to victims and watching them in their most vulnerable states, you know, that's the, how awful is it that people get off to that? Just saying. Um, yeah. Next question <laughs> is, what are some privacy tips that parents can pass on to their kids or teens? Um, you know, recognition of exploited, exploitive behavior, protecting oneself online from malicious ex, so on and so forth. I'm going to still, I'm going to like repeat what we said a little bit earlier and just like in general, have a talk about consent with your, with your kids and your teens, um, even starting at a really, really young age, like consent applies to everything. It's never not sexy. It's never weird to bring up that like, I want you to do this or that with my body or images of my body and only that, um, so yeah, just impress upon them the importance of consent and having those conversations with their partners. So if they are sharing images, which it probably will be, um, they do need to have those conversations about what is allowed to happen with those images that they do share. Yeah. Um, I also want to say- your kids. Oh, sorry. No, go on. You were clapping. I was going to say, ready. do not force your kids to hug people that i yes. can't agree more you can start talking about consent at a very early age and it's not just um, consent that you want to cover you also want to cover what your agency is um having agency 100%. over your own body how to say no how to speak out when something is making you uncomfortable 
these are conversations that people don't want to have because they're uncomfortable, but they need to. Because yeah. having them later after a victimizing incident and after trauma is going to be way more awkward, I promise. Um, not to mention traumatic. So, yeah. Sorry. I, I think just. Up. No, I, and I'm just going to pop in real fast too, like, because you're right, like, consent and agency go hand in hand. And, like, actually, just kind of recently, um, in the last couple of years, there's a new kind of method of looking at consent called the triangle of consent. I encourage everybody to look it up. Um, but that incorporates power, agency, and communication. And all three of those things come together to create consent. So I think that's a really good starting point for talking to your kids and teens. I also think I that um, a really important addition to that is um, once your kids reach the teen years and you notice that they start to look at pornography, I think that talking about consensual pornography and what that looks like and what they should be recognizing and what they should be consuming. I think that's really important as well. Yeah, I think that, yeah, having um, just healthy talks surrounding sex is really important, but it's also really important to talk to them about, you know, security and things like that. Cause they, you know, that is, this is a really big place of where both things, you know, intersect. Um, because yeah, so, I was gonna say, I agree with that. Like, you know, I mean, if your child isn't comfortable doing something with their boyfriend or their girlfriend, they should be able to say, yo, I'm not comfortable with this. Like teaching your kids the way to stand up for themselves will go a long way. And I mean, I know it's not necessarily like image abuse related, but I mean, it really is like all about teaching consent. And recognizing threats. Um, and like teaching, like just teaching kids to, to be careful when they're online and talking to people, when they're on TikTok and interacting with people that they, they think are one person, but they might be somebody else. Um, like, don't put your private information or your personal information anywhere. Um, just general OPSEC, I think, is, is really important to start that conversation as soon as your kids have access to a device. Mm -hmm. All right, um, next question, um, is, and I was told to ask this one next, is, uh, Jordan White wanted to know they have a famous friend named, you know, I'm going to redact the name because uh, the dry sand effect is real. And she has a very bad stalker who has now been stalking my other friends who have worked for her, provided outfits, business, etc. Should she contact Badass for this or something? She and her friends are very lost. Um, how would you address yeah. this? Contact us. Contact us. Yeah. Definitely. Well, Timmy, you're the one that said we need to take this question. Now. Absolutely. I mean, I think I think if there's like that public cry for help, I definitely think that that's something you should contact us with. Um, and that's the I, whole reason we have this org. Absolutely. I do want to mention that you're um, that while we do focus squarely on image abuse, OK, which is non-consensual leaking of nude images, it also has to do with upskirting any sort of non-consensual behavior online or offline that involves images. Um, you know, we get approached a lot when it comes to questions about stalking, about um, harassment, about, you know, abuse. And while we might not have every answer, um, we do know a lot of people that we can to. Um, and we will always do our best to address these issues as much as we can. Um, so yeah. I, yeah, absolutely. I think, the, I think the best way to sum it up, and I actually think Caitlin's the one that said the said this to me when I first started was, if you think you need to contact badass, like if that's even a question in your mind, reach out. Yeah, I mean, even if we can't necessarily, like, even if you don't think that it pertains to what we do, odds are somebody in this group will be able to help you um somebody has experienced what you experienced somebody is somebody's there um that's the beauty of our group is you're not alone and you always have somebody to talk to i will say that when this happens to you online especially you know when it happens to you in my situation i didn't understand the internet at all 
I uh, barely went outside Google and Facebook. And so when it happened to me, I felt really, really helpless and overwhelmed and alone. Above all, I felt isolated and scared because I didn't know who was doing this to me. I didn't know who had been helping them, who all these people making these horrible comments about my body. I didn't know who they were. So when I turned to somebody for help, it might be one of those people that's just looking to make fun of me more um, or kick me when I'm down, when I'm feeling vulnerable. So, uh, you know, just knowing that you're not alone and that there is someone that you can talk to that you can trust and who isn't going to be judging you and isn't going to be re-victimizing you is important. And that can make a huge difference. So, yeah, uh, that is absolutely have them um, contact us. They can do so with any of our Twitter handles. Um, and we'll put those in the chat and, you know, or through our website, www.badassarmy.org. Which also I saw one of the questions was, how can people support you guys? And um, how can people support y'all? And uh, the best way they can do that is through our website. We have some donation uh, links that they can use, as well as just letting people know we're here. Um, so next question. Uh, what about cases outside of the US, like Ireland or the UK? Um, we have a UK group. Um, we, do. we know people. Um, I mean, our organization has contacts like internationally for, I mean, we can, we can find someone who can help you pretty much is what my answer to that would be. Um, our, our net is wide and we can um I yeah. think we all know enough people who know people who can point you where you need to go. Mm -hmm. yeah, I also want to mention, I want to so, I just want to mention that the US is really far behind everybody else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Over That's the what UK, I was gonna say. Okay. The UK they have a bunch of orgs, their laws are built stronger. Um and Australia, oh my gosh, Australia is just really ahead of this. They have an entire section of their government that is just um you know it's a government funded organization to prevent this uh and they're already tackling things that the u.s is still you know most people don't acknowledge that they're things that exist like deep fakes or you know how this all play you know they're really starting to make things happen in australia so it yeah we have a lot of we have a lot of ways to go That's, that's literally what I was going to say, so yay. <laughs> All right. Um, somebody said it really comes down to this. How can a law or set of laws be created or phrased to fight this issue without being used to clamp down on speech or sex workers? Similar to FOSTA-SESTA, which is, um, you know, something that by all means, it was meant to help people that are getting victimized and, um, you know, help prevent this sort of victimization by, you know, in making platforms um accountable but at the same time it hasn't really been used for that has it no what it's been used for is to attack and harm sex workers um and it has a body count at this point so how do you think that we should um be addressing this in a way that isn't going to either a be used to harm sex workers or um b be used to infringe on our free speech yeah, uh, that's really hard. Uh, but like my first initial thought is to just is to kind of focus that language on like, uh, or I guess focus the law itself on proof of consent. So like, you're responsible if you're posting content to prove that the subject in that content has consented to being in it. Like, maybe if there's if that comes into play somewhere that will help a lot. Like requiring websites that allow pornography to get a release from every person that is actively participating on screen? Yeah. I mean, that wouldn't be any different than other websites that post. I mean, yeah, with verified users. Yeah. 
like just verify the user. Um, I mean, I think the U.S. Speaking of being behind and how other countries deal with it, I think the U.S. over criminalizes that behavior. Um, from my personal opinion on it, not my necessarily like legal opinion on it, but um, yeah, I, I think there's a way to write these laws that doesn't make it like that makes consensual sex work legal and doesn't criminalize it and lets people do what people are going to do. Um, I mean, we're a country founded on privacy. Let people do what they want. And also uh, a large portion of our um, victim base are sex workers because, you know, you want your photos in a consensual way to be released to a certain market in a certain bubble. And once it releases outside of that, it can be just as harmful as for anyone else, you know, so I think that these um, sorts of laws help and also harm, you know, yeah. it, it, it's double-ended. Yeah, Rachel, that's a good point too, is, um, I mean, you're, it's just because you're a sex worker doesn't mean that your copyrighted personal work isn't your intellectual property that you get to keep and that you're entitled to. It shouldn't and consent matter. for one doesn't consent to, tr to er, eh. consent for one doesn't translate to consent for many, allowing right. a certain, I mean, even transactional consent is consent. And that is the thing that matters. And it's just as traumatic to have people that you didn't want to be seeing your images or, you know, often with sex workers, we find them doxxed um, right. along I mean, with their images. So it's double the trauma right there. And I mean, I think it's the ultimate irony that we're speaking at a hacker conference where we talk about how broken copyright laws are in the DMCA. And at the same time, you know, that's one of our, as an organization, biggest tools to fight some of this, you know, mm -hmm. is co the copyright laws. Oh, yeah. Um, hey, you know, we have a really important question I do want to address. Uh, and this is from a friend of mine, Weems. Um, and they asked, what should happen is allowing rules that help victims without removing liability protections for platforms outside of CSAM and CP. I'm deeply, deeply concerned about the bills that have been proposed, like Earn It, which is definitely a pro-censorship law, and the even more worrying LAED Act, which would outlaw encryption in the U.S., and I want to know what the panel thinks about this. Um, anyone else want to take that one first, or sort of cool if I jump? You can do it. All right, cool. <laughs> Go for um, it. You know, I kind of started in on this one with, you know, uh, FOSTA SESTA, and how um, these laws, they're you one, they're using CSAM as just, you know, a way to kind of put a friendly spin on this law. Like if, you know, your lawmakers aren't passing it, that's because they hate kids. Um, but really when it comes down to it, it's, um, removing the privacy of every user. Uh, and the fact is we've seen them be put in place and we see exactly how little they actually help the things that they're supposed to be, um, preventing. Um, what these laws are going to be doing is destroying censorship and freedom. And I don't think that's right. I hate these laws. They are, I feel like they've been, uh, bought and paid for by, you know, certain, um, you know, very specific lobbies. And I think they're bullshit and we've definitely, everybody needs to get involved. If there's anything that badass has proved, it's that everybody can get involved when it comes to legislation and if you care about something, you need to start calling and making stuff happen. And you need to call your um, lawmakers and talk to them about the Earn It Act and that, you know, encryption isn't really important. It should stay something that we have available. Yeah, I'll... I mean, oh, sorry, Timmy, go ahead. Uh, real quick, I'll take a, I'll, I'll take a line out of uh, uh, a talk Cory Doctorow gave at DEF CON a couple years ago about the war on general purpose computing. And something that I think these lawmakers forget is that it is not possible to make a general purpose computer that does everything except the one thing that you don't want it to do. Um, that's just not how computers work. That's not how math works. And that is a nuance that is lost by the old white men writing these laws. Yeah, and um, that's Real a really quick. good point. Oh. Real quick, we got like a minute, so. Oh, I was just gonna say, <laughs> um, I thought you were telling me to stop. Um, 
sorry. Yeah, uh, that's a really good point, Simi. But also, like, to go off what Caitlin was saying, like, um, there is a balance between free speech and censorship. And I think um, if we're going to start doing things like outlawing encryption and censoring material, like, we really need to take that into consideration. And without boring y'all with con law jurisprudence, um, you know, that's, it's not something to be taken lightly. And I think we really need to examine how we do this and what precedent it could set for the future. I think Kate just really wanted to say jurisprudence. I did. Okay. <laughs> All right. As long as we got that cleared up, goal achieved. All right. Real quick. Um, we are going to be going into the voice chat. I know I am. Um, Cause frankly, y'all can't make me shut up. So yeah. Um, but I really quick, uh, I just want to see if anyone has one final message they'd like to share with the people watching and listening to this at DEF CON today. Anyone, final message, Rachel. Um, I'd say um, everyone, please reach out. If you have a question, comment, concern, we would love to hear you and we would love to um, integrate you into our our group. It's like, you know, <laughs> sorry. I, mean, <laughs> I cut out the webcam. Um, <laughs> I really feel that, you know, there's a place for everyone and you do not have to go through image abuse alone. We're here for you. And yeah. Jamie? Oh, me? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll keep, okay, I'll keep it quick. Uh, be awesome to one another. Fuck Cloudflare. Black Lives Matter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Allie. Gonna echo Timmy's fuck Cloudflare comment. Um, thanks for listening to us. Reach out to us if y'all need anything. We're always around to answer questions and um, we definitely are gonna keep talking about this stuff, so. Marley? Uh, ditto on what everybody said and to add to it, um, yeah, let's please keep talking about this uh, conversation about how we can make laws that don't infringe on um, speech and um, encryption, but that will help victims. I think that's a really important conversation to have and your voices are really helpful. Mm -hmm. Kate, do you just want to say jurisprudence um, again? No. <laughs> Ditto. Uh, Black Lives Matter and consent is key, y'all. Always get it. All right, I'm going to end this uh, whole thing out by saying thank you to Everyone out there watching, thank you to the, you know, everyone organizing DEF CON this year. I know it has been crazy and chaotic and you having to do a lot of things that is that are brand new. And I just want to say it's been wonderful thus far. I miss you all. I can't wait to see you in Vegas next year. Um, and meanwhile, uh, you know, life is short. Have all the orgasms, consensual, healthy orgasms or cookies, depending on what you want. Um, and just stay badass. Peace.